Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. I've got a super cool guest uh, with Ryan Lerman. He's an extremely talented guy, great work ethic. He's got a lot of things going on, really creative musically and otherwise. Uh, he's most well known uh, for Scary Pockets, but he's a very successful multi-instrumentalist sideman, music director. A uh, couple of quick announcements. I want to thank our mutual friend, Tim LeFave. Basis to the stars. Tim, thanks for hooking us up. Uh, also, make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us already on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. I think it's down there. And that little emoji that looks like a bell that helps us get recommended by YouTube. And thanks for your support on that. I'll tell you about Ryan. Uh, as I mentioned, he's probably most well known for founding, for co founding Scary Pockets. Grew up in L.A., moved to Marin County at 8, and then back down to L.A. at 18 to study at USC in the uh, studio jazz guitar program. After college, he began touring, writing, producing, and recording with the following artists, of which he played guitar, bass, keyboards, background vocals, and sometimes multiple of these on one gig. Uh, Joshua is it Radin? I'm sorry. Radin. Radin. Joshua Radin, yeah. Vanessa Carlton, a fine frenzy, which he's been, uh, no Ben folds, which he's been Ben folds bass player since 2011. Uh, Michael Buble. He was with him for six plus years. John legend for a few years. He was also his music director and string arranger and the tallest man on earth. I looked that guy up. That's such a cool name. Like I, I would like to do that. Like, the best looking guy on earth, but it's like that'd be a, <laughs> a total fraud. It would be like no, nobody well, would ever. That's the point. It's, yeah, it's ironic. Yeah. It, yeah. Cause he's just like a regular dude. He's, a, <laughs> he's not a tall, he's not a tall. <laughs> uh, Ryan has co-writes with Michael Buble and Wolfpack with uh, Corey Wong, of course. He's been collaborating with Wolfpack. Wolfpack. I love that. I always feel like I need to like get Say Wolfpack. German. <laughs> yeah, like like rawr, like growl. Uh, since 2007, he's been a couple of their videos, filmed a couple of videos, and he filmed the Madison Square Garden show on the on his iPhone. He started Scary Pockets in 2017 with his best friend since high school, Jack Conti, who's the CEO of Patreon and half of the members of Pomplamoose. Uh, Scary Pockets covers hit songs in their own style, usually incorporating some kind of a funk groove. They've collaborated with over 200 musicians and singers to make over 200 videos they have over 200 million views on youtube 750,000 youtube subscribers 600,000 monthly listeners on spotify and they've played sold out shows across the u.s and japan and one thing man I, when you look at your videos i gotta tell you you guys are always i mean it looks like you're really sincerely having a really good time man like we are we are that's that could, that's rule number one is yeah that, yeah well, that comes across. You're both like smiling and you're like, you know, Jack's a little more effusive in, emotionally than you are, but yeah, you know, you, you're like, you know, you, you can tell you're right in the groove there in the sweet spot, man. Uh, in 2019, Ryan composed and performed the score for the newest Billy Crystal movie, which is called Standing Up, Falling Down, along with David Schwartz. He also has three solo albums, Pinstripes, The Sky, friends and noisy feelings which i checked out it's a really good album he's a very talented guy man thank you so much for your time i appreciate you coming on the show thank you for having me you're welcome man it's a, a pleasure all right you study guitar at usc did you always know you're going to be a musician and did you come from a musical family no and no wow uh, my parents are my parents are lawyers and um i yeah i i assumed i'd go some some sort of similar route and uh, went to this hoity-toity high school where everybody was smarter than me. And I figured, well, if I if I can get in playing the guitar, then I, maybe I can, you know, get get into a good school. So went to USC for for guitar. And and I when I got there, I tried to change my major. I tried to, like, change it to business. And right. and the, the counselor was was like, oh, no, you you have to you'd have to reapply to the business school. And I was like, ah, well, I guess I'll just, I can get good grades, right? Playing the guitar and then I'll go to law school. And then I started touring after college and I realized like, oh, I can't stop. Wow. So you just, you were passionate about music, but then it took over pretty much. I just never thought I was uh, good enough that that was like a realistic uh, option that I could actually do it for a living. Interesting. So how did your parents, uh, were they supportive of that? Because academics, and I'll put lawyer in academics category, because yeah. it's, you know, it's a pretty academic, uh, biz, you know, uh, academic uh, oh, profession. Yeah. They tend to be a little bit not on board 
How are your folks with that? They they were um they were they they gave me healthy discouragement. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they they were I never felt like I couldn't like they they weren't like you know uh, yeah. Kevin Bacon's parents and <laughs> Footloose where yeah. they were like you can't you know but they were like are you sure you want to do this like you're all your friends are going to be making like a lot of money and you know advancing and, and you're this is hard this yeah. is like choosing to do a really hard thing and 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 uh and which was good but uh but i was sort of of the by the time i was that age i was sort of of the mentality of like uh if you can't fail if you never stop trying and i was like i'll just keep trying stuff until something works and i know i'm i'm willing to work as hard at this as I would um, at any other profession. So I might as well, might as well give it a shot. You still feel the same way. You can't fail if you never stop trying. Um, I'm less, I <laughs> less <laughs> idealistic now, uh, but I still believe that that's true. I still believe that um, that work ethic and um, your psychology and persistence is more important than talent. Yes. And, um, I agree. and yes, I, I, I still believe like if you're willing to take enough swings that like you'll, you'll find your, you'll find your thing. Dude, I agree with you. This is thing on my wall. It says there's only three reasons you will not be successful. One, you don't try new things. Two, you don't learn from what you try or three, you give up. So I'm right yeah. with you on that, man. I yeah. agree with you. Right Agreed. on. Agreed. Uh, I like that healthy discouragement. That's the first I've never heard it put like that. Um, yeah, I, kind, I kind of feel like if you can tell someone you shouldn't do music, it's pretty hard. And they're, and they go, ah, okay. And they listen to you. Then they're, they're what they didn't have the, they didn't have enough belief or drive or they didn't want it bad enough that they would have um, been able to, to go the distance anyways. Cause you're going to, you're going to be hit with a lot harder doses of reality than that along the way. Yeah. And I think that actually goes for anything. I mean, there's no, your parents when became lawyers, that's not like easy, <laughs> right? You know, you get hit with a lot of things there as yeah. well, you know? So I, I, totally. I think that's in any profession. Um, so it's, it, I don't think it's very common right after college, you're writing, producing and recording. And we talked about this before we started uh, we hit the record button. Uh, you got to be pretty driven for that. And I was curious, where did, where does your work ethic and ambition come from and what still motivates you to work so diligently? Deep. That's deep. That's a deep question. Uh, I, I don't know. I've always been like this. Um, it, I've always, um, I, I, I tend to be more of the belief that like, um, that this stuff is like more genetic than, than, uh, than nurture. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've always like, I, I, I got pro tools when from with my bar mitzvah money when I was 13 and, and I've always just, uh, liked like writing songs and making stuff and had, uh, a strong, uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, may, maybe it comes from, um, some deep psychological trauma of like, I won't be loved unless I make something great. You know what I mean? I, I actually uh, but, do. Yeah. But, um, that's like, that's, a seems to be a debate I keep getting into with uh, various therapists that I have. <laughs> no, it's a terrible thing because when you, yeah. I did this for years, man. Uh, I, you, when you tie your value yeah. to your production, Mm, yeah you're it's not a, supposed it's not it's supposed a, to be good <laughs> it's a losing because you can never produce enough right yeah and it's like impossible because whatever yeah. you do it's like well i'm not doing more that i i could still be i did that for years and when i stopped mm -hmm. my life got so much better yeah yeah and, and i was able to just say what do i what do i like and yeah not that you don't, you're not doing something you like, but I, I, I probably wasn't, I was, I was mm. just like accomplishing, you know, it was like, you know, if I got five things off my to-do list, that was a good day. If I got one off, you know, not so good. And it was mm -hmm. like insane. Like, why does that yeah. govern my self-esteem, right. man? Tying your self-worth to, to what you do. Yeah. 
it's horrible what you can accomplish yeah it's horrible man yeah dude you, you could speak to me for an hour. I'll save you all this fucking therapy. Money. I would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that being said, I agree with you. You have a, you're super driven and that work ethic is the best man that, you know, and that, like, you know, like I mentioned earlier to me, when someone has a good work ethic, it doesn't just mean they work hard. That tells you a lot about their character. People with good at work ethics are generally more honest Mm. more reliable they have less of an agenda you know it's like they're better characters overall so you know i can't fault you there man uh so so you get out of college you're writing producing what challenges did you have early on to get things up and running and like what was your first break maybe mm. um that's a great question uh well I started, um, I feel like most, most of, um, the like gigs that I've gotten have just come as a result of me making my own music. So, uh, so my, my, my buddy, Jack Conti very, um, early was doing like YouTube was doing the YouTube game, making, making videos and, and music on YouTube and was encouraging me to do the same. So right out of school, um, I just kind of set up in my grandparents' house and started like writing songs and playing all the instruments and putting them on YouTube. And um, and that sort of gives people a strong sense of what you like in, in your in your taste. Yeah. Uh, and which which end, ended up being like a decent calling card as far as like people recommending you for a gig you can just see oh it's this guy and he's they can you have a, a thing for people to um to very quickly get a sense of like your taste and um and if you'd be a good fit for for x y and z project um but uh yeah that that haven't been said i'm trying to think of what was the, the second part of your your question was what challenges? Yeah. So hold on one second. So basically, that this early platform you built on YouTube was like lead generation for you for gigs. It was kind of unintentionally. I mean, yeah. I was just trying to make. Um, I was just trying to get good at you know writing songs and making music, but I, I think yeah, I I think that was the end result. That's really cool. And so once things started moving, what kind of challenges did you have then? Like for to keep things consistent, you know, which is always the biggest challenge when you're self. Yeah. Um, well, stagnation, I think, is is um, was a challenge. Like I started to feel like um, s some like momentum as I was touring and then recording for myself on the breaks, um, and then gigs kind of ended. And then there was a period in my mid twenties where I went through like a quarter life crisis and was like, what am I? what am I doing? I'm, I'm like, if I've done this stuff, but I don't feel as strong. Like I had, I had sort of lost the, you know, um, lost the, the, the trail a little bit as far as like the direction for my sort of artist, you know, self, my, my sure. Sort of, um, and, uh, and so that was, yeah, that, that was an interesting thing to, to go through the first big, you know, sort of, that felt like the first big existential crisis of like, am I doing the right thing? Like, I feel like I, I felt like I had all of this. Um, I felt like I had a big motor that wasn't attached. Like I was trying to figure out what the right car was to attach it to. Um, and uh, that's a song lyric, man. You need to, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, right now. Uh, 14 16 <laughs> 14 yeah. that's a song lyric for the next album nice um and uh and yeah i mean pockets ultimately has has been a fun vehicle for for it in in recent years but that uh yeah that's sort of like i had this this you know this touring thing and writing and then there was like a dip around um 25 26 and then i kind of got out of it by just touring more um, right and uh and then continuing to write and do my thing you probably read a lot right um i read a decent amount i go through phases yeah i go through phases 
there's a book I think by Seth Godin called The Dip. I like Seth Godin. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that book though. It's a short little book, really good, and it talks about when you hit the dip. That's when dig in because once you come out of mm -hmm. the dip, you're going to be okay. That's like very common. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good yeah. book. It's a it's a good cool. little book. I'll check that out. Uh, okay, you started working for. I mean, all the artists you've worked for are really successful. I mean, I'm sure you have, there's some people here that you work for that are not on this list, but by and large, you've worked for a lot of successful artists and you've kind of like continued to evolve in there. Um, I'm going to mention a few of them. If you could talk about how you first wound up connecting with them and maybe a cool or interesting story about working with them. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's start with Ben Folds. And also, when did you start playing bass, man? That's <laughs> Yeah, my spare uh, time, I learned how to play bass good enough to play in Ben Folds band. I mean, that's yeah. like pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, I love Ben. Ben is one of my favorite people on the planet. Um, and uh, I met Ben through Jack uh, because Ben and Jack Conti had both spoken at some music tech conference. They got connected there. They did a song together, Jack uh, Ben with Pomplamoose. And then Ben actually asked Jack, his bass player was leaving and he asked Jack if Jack would want to play bass with him. And Jack was doing his own thing and Pomplamoose and said, um, he called me and said, Hey, Ben folds, would you want to play bass with Ben folds? Uh, I was like, I don't think I, I don't really, I don't really play bass. <laughs> and, Jack, and Jack was like, uh, he asked me to play bass. So if, if he thinks I can do it, then you can definitely, <laughs> you do, can it. definitely do it. Right, right. Yeah. And, um, and so I had in a fine frenzy, I played bass on a couple songs. Mm. Um, me and the other guitar player, Omar Velasco, uh, would just trade off playing the bass cause there was no bass player. Um, and, uh, and so I, I was kind of familiar, I was kind of familiar, but by no means good. Right. Um, and I just lied. I just figured like, I, I didn't know Ben's music very well at that point, but um, I listened to a bunch of it and, and really liked it um, and thought it would be a fun challenge. And, um, and so, yeah, I left Fine Frenzy. I told Ben that I played the bass uh <laughs> right on <laughs> I just i did the thing where you lie and then yeah you, everybody does that it's so cool <laughs> yeah um and uh and he i just had one phone call with him and he was like well jack's a great musician if he thinks you can do it then um you got the gig and i don't really do auditions so like here's the dates and um and uh, it's yours wow and so he had never he he'd seen like my youtube videos where i i can play bass um but had never, we'd never played together. never heard me play. Um, he's very trusting. And so basically I, I just went, I just went on a deep dive and, um, and learned, uh, I like got the whole catalog there, uh, and literally learned every single song he'd recorded and transcribed the bass lines on every single song. So I could play note for note. Holy crap. Uh, every, every single bass note on every single Ben Folds recording because I figured uh, if I could do that then he's not going to fire he's probably not going to fire me if I just stick to I didn't trust myself to be able to just like do my thing because I didn't yeah. have a thing on the bass right. so that's kind of where I started and then I think like he a couple weeks in or whatever he probably noticed that I was playing like the exact same thing every night right. and, uh, and he he uh he told me he's like you know um you can you can do like i you can play things on with me that would get you fired from any other gig you oh can, that's awesome yeah he's that's like, very cool do whatever you want and uh so he kind of gave me permission i think to like you know that's awesome and try stuff but yeah he's he's the best what a good story story um so like what was your we, you had to be nervous like first rehearsal first oh day. my god i was <laughs> terrified <laughs> i was terrified there was this great moment where uh and like i i got like i went hard i mean i got i, I got a few lessons with jerry west jerry watts do you know oh, yeah I, had, I know jerry i had him on the show here yeah yeah, yeah. LA, la guy great yeah yeah and playing. there was this great moment jerry watts jr yeah yeah i was taking this lesson uh 
with Jerry, with Jerry, just trying to learn like, so how, what's like the right way to do this? Um, and then like halfway through the lesson, he was, cause I told him I, was, I had this gig and, and he was like, um, what, so what's the gig that you're doing? And I told him Ben Folds and he looked at me like, <laughs> like you are not fit <laughs> how do you how do you have this uh, and but anyways we we got to um like the first the first Classic. time i sat down to play with ben uh we were at rc the rca a room in nashville where mm -hmm. it was just like famous huge room that was ben's studio at the time and we like sat down to play the first song and um and I was I was pretty nervous, and it started with just kick drum and bass, and this figure that was like, boom, boom, ba -dum, dum, boom, boom, ba -dum, boom, and um, I was just not locking. I was so nervous. I was, and he, and so we played the so it was a rehearsal for like the shows that were coming up in a few days, but he was recording everything, and he was like, man, I don't think the um. I think something's weird uh, with like the kick mic. I'm going to go in and listen. And, <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, it's not the kick mic. It's just, <laughs> it's just holding. Yeah. And, and just that feeling of like, Oh God, he's going into the control room to listen to, to, uh, so anyways, it was, it was, it kicked my ass, but somehow, yeah. Somehow but you got it. through it, man. Yeah. That's good. I just can't imagine that very first that had to be like, very nerd like it was when, yeah it was terrifying yeah. and then he does he does these things in his shows called rock this bitch mm -hmm. have you ever been to a ben fold i haven't man i haven't yeah. he does this thing where if someone yells from the crowd rock this bitch in like a moment of silence he just starts making up a song and oh. it happens every show and well it's it's like a band improvisation where he's making up a song and we just try to keep up and um one of the first shows if not the first show was at the Vic in Chicago. Okay. And there's like that couple thousand people, two, three thousand people. And in the middle of the rock, this bitch, it like my first show, like really playing the bass. He just points at me and goes, bass solo. <laughs> and I'm just, it was just like, yeah, I've just in the middle, uh, in you know, in the middle of this room, I don't know what I what I did, but I've never felt more inadequate in my life. It was terrible. Wow. Did you like totally like, collapse after no, no, the no. show? I, th I, no, I, did, no. I did fine. I just remember thinking in my head, like, I wonder how many bass players um, there are in this room right now <laughs> that would, could sound better than me. But I, wow. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I did fine. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Man, you've been with them 10 years now. Yeah. Something's working. <laughs> that's all right man great story thank you yeah uh michael buble mm -hmm. another super successful guy how did you connect with him and then you guys did co-writes you wrote yeah together. yeah um that came through joel shearer yeah i had him on my show i know joel yeah, yeah joel see I i'm running joel. out of people man i told you this right <laughs> <laughs> i love joel um joel i i don't remember how we i met joel but joel um recommended me to alan chang who's who's buble's music director and um and uh, alan was a big ben folds fan is a big oh ben folds. okay so uh so I'm, I'm sure that didn't hurt and we yeah we got together they were looking for the sort of second chair guitar that was a multi-instrumentalist uh mm. so i played like you know key stuff like uh doubling string parts and organ and bongos and bat and singing and guitars. Um, and, uh, and so that's, yeah, that was, that was the connect there. And, uh, and that was fun. It was a fun how'd, gig. how'd you wind up doing co-writes with him? Um, I wrote a song with Larry Goldings, mm. um, called half of the way, okay. uh, which, we wrote for Buble, um, and I recorded a demo um, and put like horns on it, and it was I was really proud of it, and um, played it for him uh, when we were on tour together, and he loved it. Uh, it was very exciting, and then throughout 
I played it for him like maybe six months before he actually started working on his next record. And then by the time we, we got there, he was like, um, he was, you know, writing with different people and excited about other songs. And uh, long, long story short, we I ended up going up to Vancouver with Alan and we wrote with him for like a week and a couple of songs ended up coming out of that. But this, that song half of the way that he ended up recording and then it ended up not making the record. Oh, so, so I, I put it out and Wolfpack uh, put it out. Uh, that's really ended, cool. Man. Ended up being a Wolf, a Wolf tune. So that's yeah. very cool, man. Yeah. That's really good. That's gotta be, uh, so like when that happens, do you sort of say to yourself, this is like a career progression? I got a guy that's, you know, selling millions of records or streams, whatever, millions of records, and he's inviting me to participate with him. That's that's got to be like a like a yeah. validation, man, in some way, you know? Yeah, if yeah, totally. It yeah. was really yeah. exciting. And um, and uh, yeah, definitely definitely a fun a fun thing to be a part of so let me ask you this when you when things like that happen like um his md is alan you said yeah <clears throat> excuse me so when alan happens to be a ben folds fan yeah or when ben folds says oh there's no audition because you know jack says you're in <clears throat> yeah how do you look at that stuff do you look at it as serendipity it, like uh I don't know if you're spiritual or not, like it's a God thing or, or just random luck. How do you, how do you, if you look at it at all, some people, you know, maybe you don't. I don't. Yeah. Um, I don't think too much about, about it. Uh, I, I think good people, I, I think it, um, it feels good. I get right. a lot of enjoyment out of connecting people that I love. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think, yeah, so, so I, I, I think that's kind of how things tend to happen. It's like, um, uh, yeah, the, the person that's doing the recommending, it feels good to like, right. to see, to see a place that this person would fit well in and then right. to make that happen. So, so, um, yeah, things, things have, it has generally just been a like, oh, this person connects you to this person, connects right. you to this person. And then, um, yeah, so, so I, I don't know, I don't know who's pulling the strings up there, but yeah, I'm always curious, like why yeah. this, you know, and I probably shouldn't be, I, I should just like, you know, but that's just my makeup, you know, wonder how things right. happen or why, you know, yeah. uh, John legend and you were his MD as well. And string arranger again, yeah. big, big positions working with a big artist. How did that come about through Ben? Um, ah. Yeah, to continue the yeah. connect the, the connect the dots. You ever want to? You ever think about making a mind? I've always thought about making a <laughs> mind map of like how I got to this guy. It's you know that, yeah. those are, you're, you've seen those right mind maps. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're so cool. I was like, you know, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. So I think John actually, um, or somebody from his camp, um, was talking to Ben about touring together mm. um, because Ben is an amazing uh, arranger okay um, and like i don't know if you if you've if you're hip to the stuff that he's been doing with orchestras i'm not but, but i'm going to check it out now that you're yeah going he, on this track. He, wrote, he wrote a piano concerto wow that, that uh is like incredible an incredible piece of music and like apart from the virtuosity of what he's actually doing on the piano it's just like that that he keeps growing and keeps you know going into uncharted territory is very cool and inspiring but anyways ben was doing stuff with orchestras and arranging and whatnot and um and so i think someone from john's team or john had reached out to him about because john was looking to do something stripped down for performing arts centers um and so ben recommended me to uh john and um and yeah that we we uh so I, it ended up being like me playing the guitar and him. And originally he wanted, he wanted to do, um, he wanted to do like a more of a full orchestra type of thing where 
in every city we would pick up an orchestra oh, wow. and um and so to me that that was like a yeah i tried to figure out a way to make that work and at the end of the day i i felt like um we it would have more of a it'd be a little more consistent if we were touring with more of a stripped down thing but it was the mm -hmm. same people every night so that's what we ended up doing was string quartet plus me and and john yeah plus i can't imagine even at john legend level the cost of picking up an orchestra in every town yeah. that's and you're playing performing arts center. you're not playing like stadiums man that's exactly yeah that's a exactly. big nut man yeah that's really cool and how did so i so was you, ben was off during that time or yeah okay yep. so it all worked out yeah that's wonderful man buble was on though which was, was difficult so i was going back and forth between the two of those for a while wow yeah it's a good problem to have though yeah yeah that's cool yeah <laughs> uh any other gigs ryan that you want to chat about that were cool or fun that or that you have some nostalgic memories of or um uh I don't, I don't think so. I mean, okay. they're all, they're all, yeah, they're all, they're all fun. Tallest man on earth was really fun too. That was like post legend just because he's so great. And just, I learned, I learned a lot from just watching him do his thing every night. Right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, really good group of guys like from, from Eau Claire and uh, Christian is from, uh, Sweden, is he from Sweden? Yeah, some, some like that. Yeah. Uh, Stockholm, um, and uh, uh, so, anyways, that that was that was a blast. Um, yeah, uh, they're all each one of those outings are just like they be people become your family, and and it's it's it was like such a fun way to to learn and make friends like, and, uh, and see the world like yeah. touring in your twenties. It's just, it was the best. That is cool. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about scary pockets. What prompted you guys to start scary pockets? Um, well, um, I, I had just turned 30 it was literally Jack, uh, drove down. Um, I had like a dinner for my 30th birthday and Jack drove down for the dinner. And then um, he had, he was a couple years into Patreon at this point. And he had to, he like didn't have any time to play music anymore. And Jack is an amazing musician. Like one of my, he was making um, great records. He's a great songwriter. He's an amazing producer. And here's this guy who like, you know, has this amazing idea for a company and, and now he can't play music anymore. So this, he sort of pitched this idea to me on, on a walk the day after my dinner, we got coffee and we got went on a walk and he, um, he, the idea was basically postmodern jukebox meets Wolfpack. And uh, <laughs> that's what it, that's, that's exactly what it is. That's pretty, yeah. yeah <laughs> you, you stuck to that formula, man. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. So, um, so we had our first, it was very calculated and like, we were like, all right, we'll do a, a day a month or, or at that point it was two days uh, a month, like Saturday, Sunday, record two songs each day and we'll release them once a week. And, um, and I don't think we've missed a week. That was, that was like four and a half years ago. And, um, after, after a couple of months, we realized, um, oh, the amount of time that we spend on each song doesn't necessarily make the song better um let's just do one day we'll do four songs in a day and release them once a week so that's that's basically what it's been so you have to get together once a week for this project we get together once a month once a month okay i'm sorry and then you, yeah okay and we release the songs once a week once a week okay yeah um wow that's really interesting postmodern so did you, was his thought, pro and I guess I have to ask him, but his thought process was just, hey, this works and it's cool. And this works and it's cool. Let's put them together. So it has to work and be cool. Like, like almost simple math or like, I'm, I'm sure you had no idea how well, how popular it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, well, I think that the, the, the problem 
uh, that needed solving or, or the goal was let's make the, the most amount of music in the least amount of time and have the most amount of fun. That's, right. the, that's at the core of pockets is just like not overthinking, throwing stuff at the wall, having a ton of fun and some things will work and some things won't work. So, um, so yeah, Wolf, um, we had, I had already recorded a song with Wolfpack at that point um, and become friends with, uh, with those guys um, through, through Ben Folds, by the way, another, another. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I experienced the magic of like the way that they record music. And right. I, I cannot speak highly enough about Jack Stratton mm -hmm. and just how brilliant he is, uh, who's the mastermind behind Wolfpack. Um, and I, I love all those guys. Uh, and anyways, we, we, so I recorded one of my songs, which was called Do With You with Wolfpack. And basically I showed up nobody knew the song um I, I mean like charles jones was singing it and he had like lyrics on his piano like there had not been a lot of thought it seemed like put into this uh how we were going to do this and everyone sat down there was a guy filming on an iphone with a gimbal and we like played it through once or twice and then did like three takes and it was done so quick and um and it was such a revelation because it was so different from how I had always recorded music. Like any, any album that I had made was like me alone in my room doing a gazillion takes, getting everything exactly perfect right. and like spending like days and weeks on doing like a million mixes. And I'm just so, you know, neurotic, high conscious. I'd, I'm like, get everything yeah, and this was the opposite. It was like show up, cool, two take, good take. All right, we got it. Yeah, and uh, and it was yeah, it was just such a revelation about what is music. You know what I mean? It's like you're trying to make someone feel something. So how do you do that? If you generate that feeling, you actually have that feeling, and then you record yourself having that feeling it translates done um, yeah and then you're done and and if there's mistakes then like it makes it kind of makes it better because it's real you know what i mean uh, that's a moment that actually happened um and uh and so that we we i had sort of had that experience so um and then the the pmj thing was more of just like a workflow of like oh song a week so trying to apply and how do you do a song a week is you've got to use songs that are already written or already hits. So it was like the application of that sort of revelation that like, oh, capturing live takes on, you know, released in this format. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's it's been fun. It's been fun. So a couple of things uh, in follow up. One thing you said that I think is very important. You said some things will work and some won't. Mm -hmm. I, I think any business owner, I mean, if you don't have that attitude, I mean, you you won't do anything. If you, it's, right. you know, if you just think, uh, oh, I'm crushed, this didn't work. And just keep, like you said, keep throwing pitches or just keep yeah. stepping up to the plate, man. Yeah. And I think that's a very key thing. So Scary Pockets kind of, it changed your outlook. Did it change how you behave now when you're making your own stuff or are you still mental? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. have you let go a little bit yeah okay good. um a, a little bit a little bit it, <laughs> it's, like this much <laughs> yeah it's really hard when i'm when i'm recording my music yeah um, i don't know that i i've really been successful at applying that yeah uh, concept because i kind of like the tinkering you know what i mean and mm. i do have such a clear like that, yes, if I applied the, the pocket sort of mentality to my own music, like it might be more, um, it might be more successful and it might be more of a thing to try in the future. But yeah, I, I still, I still tinker pretty hard. I, I still get pretty OCD with, um, with my songs, but other projects that I've been a part of, um, 
definitely like I, I I'm able to take a, a, a longer view approach and hear a take for what it is and embrace certain like you know flaws or whatever just yeah. as long as it, it captures captures a vibe I think being on video gives you more freedom as well yeah you know uh people see what's going you're playing live it's more forgiving yeah much people, more, it makes sense it makes sense to people and they can attach what they're hearing with what they're seeing right. and so there there it takes uh, onus off of like there's so much more information and people naturally are so much more visual than auditory yes. that if something looks convincing um they're more forgiving for whatever is going on you know sound wise well they also get the visual of the, each musician you mm -hmm. guys having a good time yeah that carries a lot of weight too and that why you know it's like when you're in you know everybody makes a mistake when they're playing a show mm -hmm. nobody in the audience is like oh that guy really screwed that note up right <laughs> you yeah. know it's like it's the whole experience and mm -hmm. nobody cares it's the vibe right and you get more vibe oriented stuff i think on video than you do on just flat out audio mm -hmm. which helps. exactly yeah which is cool totally uh in talking with fans over the years, what do the fans like most about the band and the covers that you do? Um, I, I think I think people connect with um, with the fun that we're having and the fact that like we don't take ourselves that seriously. Um, and I I think people um, I think people connect with um let's see it's a good question um yeah i i think people just respond to like us not really being too precious and having a yeah, good time that's great i would imagine so like that's the first thing i noticed when i was watching the videos it's like yeah i mean and then and then you're uh see now your people that you're collaborating with they come in with a totally different vibe because for them, they're like, you know, I, they're not as forgiving as you guys are probably because they're an, they're an invited guest. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's a good combination for everybody there, I think. And that comes because you could see everybody coming in, man. They are, they're bringing it, man. They're giving 110%, everybody in that yeah. room, you know, totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. What's the process from a licensing standpoint? How does that work? You guys decide you want to cover a song. It's like a performance license or something. How do you, and is that what it is? How, or how does that all work? Yeah. Well, I, th I think YouTube, um, I think it's different for different venues. Like where, you know, the licensing process for DSPs is different for live is different for YouTube. So, okay. So I think YouTube, um, and I don't know a ton about this stuff, but I think YouTube basically has like some sort of generalized agreement with all of the majors that like they won't take down um, covers that are the people post on YouTube. But um, whoever owns the publishing to whatever song you're doing can claim your video and run right. ads over it and make money off of it. Okay. Um, so I think basically how it works is, is, uh, that happens and then the videos on youtube are split up into um like the three things like the publishing and then maybe like the master and then maybe like the video itself something right. like that, that and then sense. we're we're allowed to make money off of the master and the the video but the publisher gets to to claim that money and then um and then across other distribution like dsps um we use a service called SoundDrop, which mm. which um, which manages all all of the licensing for. Okay, uh, so they coordinate it, take a fee out of that for their third party administration. Okay, that's interesting. Thanks, man. I was I'm always yeah. curious about that. Um, yeah, because it's sometimes guys will come on the show and they'll have a guitar and they're like, "Hey, I'll let me play some." Like, if you don't own the publishing, don't play yeah. it because they'll pull it down. Because I've had that where some yeah you know, the publishers are like, eh, no, no way. Yeah, so. we have had a couple of videos just get taken down. Um, yeah, that's happened a couple of times, and then 
I think we're usually able to, we, we were with studio 71, which is a multi-channel network. Mm. And, um, and I think they're able to sometimes work magic and. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. They have your guys reach out to my guys. It's so ridiculous. You know, you, you need like a, like a bunch of suits and rooms making decisions right. or something like that to get the same thing that like, you could just have a 30 second conversation with man. go figure that out. I don't get it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So you grew up North of San Fran and in LA. What, what was your childhood like? And you, I know you moved back and forth a couple of times. What was that? Yeah. Um, very, very, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty good childhood. Uh, um, we, we moved back and forth a couple of times. Um, I'm the oldest of four. Oh my God. Uh, what's that? I said, Oh my God, I've had oh, yeah. I have three and it's just been like, I'm it, it's so, you know, they're all older now, but God, four. Wow. Your parents yeah. Survived. Yeah. So busy parents, a lot going on, but yeah, but real good, you know, good family and, and, um, and uh, def definitely, you know, not much to complain about there. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, you're also involved with the other side of licensing where you're, you're sync licensing your own material to create movie scores like the, uh, the Billy Crystal one. Oh yeah. Uh, so I have some questions on that. How did you get into licensing music and, and what was that experience like for you? Um, well, that project came about through David Schwartz, who, mm -hmm. um, who wrote all the music for Arrested Development and a bunch of other uh amazing tv shows um and uh uh he he asked me there there was like a movie that he was going up for that he thought like my sort of uh the the vibe of the score that i guess he he thought would work for it was similar to like the vibe of my music mm -hmm. and so um we did he called me in to do something um, kind of like as an audition to like score a scene together. And, um, I hadn't really done that before. Um, but it was a blast and we all, we both, he's a great bass player. And, um, between he and I, we played all the instruments and did this scene and then we got the film. And so we spent about a month, um, scoring the movie together, just the two of us like that in his studio. Uh, and, I learned a ton just like watching, watching him, um, work and watching the way, uh, watching the way that he thinks about music as, as way more sort of goal oriented of like, uh, okay, what, what he, here's the thing. And then how do we get it to match this thing? And what can we do to make it happier? What can we do to, to make it feel, to make the pace feel, you know what I mean? Just that whole that whole way of thinking about um, writing and recording music was so different than anything I'd been a part of. Um, and it was, it was a blast. So we did that. We scored it in like a month and then wrote a couple songs for like uh, the beginning um, op the opening credits and the end credits with his daughter, who's an amazing singer and songwriter, Lucy Schwartz. Um, and, uh, and then we recorded the songs with um, a couple of the guys from Dawes, that band Dawes. And, uh and Antoine Stanley from Wolfpack sang sang one of the songs and and um yeah super fun super fun project to work on different scoring it's different writing to most to moving pictures yeah then it's a bit what was the biggest challenge of that <sighs> um that's a good question um well, it's totally different if you've never done it before it's like yeah, you know. it's it's a new it was a new process and just uh so just I guess getting getting used to that, getting mm -hmm. used to like watching something and just playing something and paying attention to like how does this inform the way I feel when I see this. Yeah. Uh, is is a very different process than just sitting there with a guitar trying to write about my feelings. Yeah. Yeah. You have any other side hustles going like, uh, besides licensing either in the music business or, uh, or out of the music business besides, you know, conventional touring and playing and sessions and stuff. Um, uh, do I have any other side hustles? Uh, With all your free time. <laughs> <laughs> um, not, not really. Uh, I, I, um, I'm working on a, 
a, a guitar record with Mason Stoops. Have you talked to Mason yet? No, no. Mason's great. Um, great guitar player. Great guy. Um, and I've sort of gone in the last year or so. Um, Mason has um, has managed to completely drain my bank account with uh, the amount of gear. Uh, gear that he okay, cuz he's he does a lot of gear demos isn't he He knows every he knows everything about gear. He just knows <laughs> everything about gear which is very a very dangerous. He's been a very expensive friend for me. Uh, cuz he'll just an send expensive me cool. Yeah, he basically um this is a whole other tangent but like uh we started we started hanging and he showed me reverb and I didn't really know anything <laughs> about reverb. Oh, it's and, he showed me like his feed on his phone of like, it's like it, cocaine, man. It's just like the most amazing cool. I was like, what is, what is all this? <laughs> like the most amazing gear. Yeah. Like it, it's, and, and, um, and then I realized um, that I had, I'd never really sold gear before and I had guitars sitting around, you know, just accumulate instruments sure. over the years. And there were so many guitars that I've, have just sat there but i'd never play them and I'm, they don't really inspire me and um so i took one that i'd that i'd um that i'd had since like high school that had like appreciated you know in value right and i was i was like ah it's kind of i'm kind of sentimental about it i don't know if i should and i sold it and it was this feeling of like oh my god i'm getting rid of something that i wasn't using and now I have money to that, that, buy something that I that's right. inspiring, and that just set <laughs> off this like. So the last the last year, like I have just um, all this. There you go, man. Well, the, um, the bad thing about that is, you'll listen to a record and you're like, and somehow you look up the amp. You say, "Oh, it was a Gibsonette eight watt amp. I love right. that sound. I yeah. gotta have one. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. you can have one. You just yeah. Call now you can. That's yeah. the dangerous part. Yeah, yeah. So so it's been it's been a fun sort of like hobby and a fun thing to do together uh, with Mason. So I ended up selling like a, just most like a, a lot most of my um, gear, like most mm -hmm. of my guitars and amps and stuff, and just finding like cool, weird, cheap stuff on Reverb. Yeah, and um, and. And then, so we, we'd basically like hang once a week through the pandemic. We were sort of bubbled together. Uh, and, and he, Mason would come over and we'd mess with like whatever gear I had, you know, acquired recently. And then uh, like halfway through, we, we realized like, maybe we should actually try to like make, make something with this time. And so we just started uh, every Tuesday, he'd come over and we'd just record using all this like fun gear that we'd been messing with um like a lot of rubber bridges like baritone kind of fretless like just weird weird guitars and amps and effects and and like uh outboard gear you know delays and whatnot um and so we've we've i would say we're probably about 75 percent done with a guitar record with a guitar yeah with the guitar record and it's been it's been a blast so i'm excited to um to to put that out into the world that's very cool you can call it i was just looking at is reverb can you spell it backwards can you call your record nice <laughs> reverb b-r-e-v-e-r -E -E nice i like yeah, it yeah I think, it's, that. I think it's a consideration well that's yeah, cool so man this I'm is glad just you get basically just become one big reverb ad now yeah <laughs> totally man uh low points you mentioned uh you know, in your twenties, you had a, a, a sort of a dip as you call it. Yeah. Any other low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and, and how'd you get through them? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> we uh, need to get your therapist in on the zoom. Yeah. Call hold here. on. Let me call my therapist. <laughs> have her make a list. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, there, there, ha there, there definitely have been, I mean, I tend I'm generally like, yeah, I, I would say I have a tendency towards like dark, dark, darkness, like anxiety and depression. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. And so that's been like a battle, like my whole life. Sure. Um, which you might hear if you listen, listen to my music. Well, you know, it's funny when I listened to noisy feelings. Yeah. I said, this guy's like happy Elliot Smith. 
Is that his name? Yeah. Was that his name? Elliot Smith, right? Yeah, yeah. I that's mean, the, that's a huge, that is a huge compliment. Yeah, but because it, it was like. It's also a low bar to be a happy Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean it like it, the music was great. But it was, oh, I mean, I, you can obviously feel that, right? Thank but it you. wasn't like, you know, you when you listen to his stuff, it's like, it's, yeah. it's, it's dark. It's, it just doesn't, oh, like, yeah. you know you don't listen to it and feel good afterwards and you listen to your music it's it's there's positive stuff going like you could tell man i'm freaking trying here man yeah i, I want to you know this is about being happy but yeah. it you know it had that undertone that's exactly what i said to yeah myself, like an right? undertone of melancholy yeah, yeah right I, melancholy. I love elliot smith is so close to my uh my heart and harry nielsen yeah um, sure uh is was a huge one but also Elton John and Billy Joel um, and just like and Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder um, always been inspired by um, like the craft of songwriting. I just yeah. love songs. I love like well-structured uh, songs. And um, so, and also people like McCartney and Stevie and Elliot, people that can play everything well enough to execute their ideas. And like a lot of times you hear their ideas through their playing where like you'll hear Beatles record where like McCartney's playing drums or whatever. And um, it's not slick, but like a lot of times, but you, it, it makes it cooler because like you hear what he's trying to do through whatever technique that he has. So I was always inspired by, by, um, you know, people like that. It's very thoughtful too. You can see that you're, I mean, you, you could, when you listen to your music, it's thoughtful. It's not like, I mean, I wasn't surprised when you said, you know, I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm really like detailed little OCD on it. Cause it's thoughtful. Yeah. You can see it's deliberate. It's not like, you know, you just throw a bunch of stuff out there as well. Yeah. You might you even know. argue it's too thoughtful. <laughs> no, that's for you to judge. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, for creatives it, it's not an uncommon thing for creatives to deal with depression or just you know that the darkness you know i think yeah. i've spoken to hundreds of people on the show literally that have had mm. to deal with that so um is there anything musically you haven't done yet that you like to which i know it's hard because you're you're only in your 30s man yeah yeah um yeah um of course. I, 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 let's see. I, I mean, I love, there, there's, there's so much, I would love to do more with, with orchestra. I love like use, using that as, as like a, a, a tool for production. Um, and the, the stuff that I, that I have done so far has just been like, it's like an instrument, you know, playing the orchestra is like, just there's like there's with John's a, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which, which was so, so fun to get to like zero in on using the string quartet, um, mm. as a, as an instrument, but expanding like that palette and doing more stuff like that. Um, I would love to do, uh, there's, there's just like a gazillion people's records that I would love to make. That's, that's like what's happened through, through um, meeting and working with all of these insanely talented people through scary pockets is I just, I fall in love with everyone. And I'm like, yeah. Oh my God, how do you not have, how do you not have three records out? Like we, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so, so are you yeah, doing producing? I, are you starting to do producing with some of these guys? I've, or, yeah, guys? I've, I've always kind of pro produced. I mean, not, not on like a super large, scale but my um my own records and and records for friends you know here and there um but uh but yeah going going further down the path of like uh the sort of john bryan route of um of like exploring movies more and exploring helping other people um bring their you know visions to life uh that type of thing i'd, I'd love to get deeper into Awesome. I think you'd do well with the the sync stuff because most of the people I know that do that are successful, pretty deep. And I think the better, you know, you have to be able to tap into ver various emotions successfully. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and you, you know, you, when the, when you're a deep person, that's what you tend to do anyway. 
Mm -hmm. So it gives you a bit of a leg up almost. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, This is probably a big list, but anybody you haven't played with yet that you'd like to play with. Um, You got that platform, Scary Pockets, which is like, I know you could could take your list and just. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's a ton. There's a ton of people. Um, uh, Yeah. I mean, Schofield, um, you know, uh, everyone, just the list. I mean, the list is, is kind of endless, but, but, um, but yeah, we, we haven't done anything with, with Tori Kelly yet, which I feel like would be fun. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, we, we, we have an actual list. You have an actual list. That's cool. It's there's, yeah, there's a lot of people on it. All right. Let's talk about gear for a minute. Tell me, uh, What's your go-to guitar right now, and what other two would round out your top three? Oh, Craig, what? How much time do you have? <laughs> yeah. I love that old amp that you got there. I don't know what that is, but maybe this you is Mason's. Oh, this is, is it Mason's amp? Um, it's a Premier eighty-eight, and they're like impossible to find. Um, and is that eighty-eight watts? No, no, it's um. I don't know what why the number eighty-eight exists. That's just like the the model, um, but it's uh, it's like a fifteen-inch speaker and it th- those two things kind of fit together as like a suitcase it was like but it's from like the late 40s i believe they were made in new york it's so cool and, looking um, and it's somehow like more hi-fi than 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 modern amps while still sounding old right uh, and like the tone it has draw bars for the for the for the eq um and like the bass like the low frequency response is amazing and like crystal clear highs it's just it's one of my one of my favorite amps um that i've that i've played through so mason's been uh you know kind enough to leave it leave it here for a while tell me um, uh guitar wise gu- now yeah guitars um so so many there's there's this one that i've put together recently um which you know Ry cooter's blue guitar uh I, I, man you know i never knew much about rye cooter i don't so so rye cooter had the 67 daphne blue strat um that he famously has modified um and just continuously uh tinkered with over the years um and so you see him from different eras and he has different pickups in it um and uh and he just, it was like this big thing in the guitar world because he put it up for sale via retro for it, I think for $150,000. And it was like this, like, wow, oh my God, that's the guitar um, that he's like most, you know, known for. And he's selling it, what's happening? And how can we all pool our money together? <laughs> <You> Timeshare <laughs> his guitar. <a> co-op. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um, but he, um, so, so basically one of the things that I've been doing in the last year is, um, finding, uh, like cheap guitars from the sixties, like pre 66, uh-huh. that just feel amazing, um, and are like undervalued and then putting different pickups in them and playing with just like, you know, string gauges and vibratos and pickups. And, um, and so the first one, the first one that I did. And you can you swap out your own pickups and stuff? No, I don't do it myself. Um, okay. My friend Ruben, who has a shop called Old Style, um, does most of this work for me. And so this is like, you know, a guy tone pickup uh, in the neck and this um, Chicago lap steel. It's like a Lawler. This is That's not so, I, I, I've had some people put lap steels into their guitars. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so it was this sort of like taking, um, Taking the sort of co- concept that uh, that Rye um, was like uh, p- responsible for pioneering, which is just like not being so precious about your guitar, tinker with it, you know, um, try different pickups, you know, um, and a lot of people look at old instruments and feel like, oh, I can't mess That's with sacred. this. It's like this vintage is valuable, it's collect, and so. So I'll find things that are cheap and maybe already messed with a little bit. So, um, and, and just, yeah, getting like taking pickups from Tysco guitars or like a lot of uh, Japanese six guitars from the sixties have right. really cool pickups. And so anyways, I, 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 I put together the, the pickup combination that's in rise blue guitar, which is 
um, a Gaiatone pickup from an LG 50 uh, in the neck and a Bigsby uh, pickup in the bridge. Where did you even uh, find the Bigsby pickup? That's a great question. Uh, there, there's a guy named Todd Kleinsmith. Oh, who, Portland, uh, Oregon. I, I don't know where he lives. Is that, do you know it, Todd? I, I think I read about this. Is this the guy who's, uh, place burned down yes yeah a buddy yes uh, uh richard bennett sent i don't know if you know richard sent me no an article about this oh he's, my god he's, yeah he's, i mean uh, it's tragic but this is yeah. before his place burned down i i i forget who i think it was who who told me about todd another sort of guitar um uh maybe pickup maker or something like that said try this guy he has new old stock big B, bigsby magnets and so Todd made um, made made me this Bigsby pickup with new old stock uh, Bigsby magnets, and I can go grab it for you. Yeah, man, I'd love to see. What, what was that other one? Was that like a Jag Stang or something like that? That's a that's just a Mustang. That's okay, like C five Mustang. Okay. So this is this is the newest creation. Wow. Um, Holy. Sh so yeah. What what is that? So this is a Dan Electro. This is like a. a yeah, I guess like maybe a, I forget what this body was. It was like a duo sonic. Um, okay. Yep. Maybe a duo sonic body from like a 60, 67 uh, duo sonic. And then it had a different neck on it that I didn't love. Um, so it's a Mustang, like a 65 um, Mustang neck. And then this was from a guy tone LG 50. This is a new old stock Bigsby and then 60s. 60s Bigsby and uh and it's so this is this has just been the thing and then what, um what color was that originally if you even know it's like tv tv yellow or something or yeah TV white or whatever but yeah it's just like it's worn and in, in the coolest way and the, yeah. the the checking is amazing and the neck feels like an old t-shirt and uh it's it's my friend alex fink refretted it and so now it's how, how much of a pain in the butt would that be to just eke out a couple of sounds on that? I'd love to hear what that sounds like. Oh yeah. Thanks. Uh, man. Let, me, let me plug her in. Thank you so much. Of love to hear those pickups. Now you're playing this out of Mason's premier amp. Um, yeah, let's use the premier. Sure. Yeah. This is a big reverb commercial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Dude, I love that room you're in. It's like totally minimal, minimalist, but minimalist, but Thank it's got you. all the right things in there. Yeah, yeah, I like um, smooth. I, I like clean lines. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's nice and chimey. Yeah, it sounds old. Man, so, that's really pretty. Yeah. Do you happen to know Val McCallum? I don't. Uh, he's a guy in LA. He likes. Oh, is he? Is he play with uh, Jackson? Jackson. Brown? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know him, but yeah, I know of him. Yeah. He, uh, he has a lot of old guitars like that where he swaps out for odd pickups mm. as well. I can hook you guys up if you want. He's a lovely cool, guy. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, he does a lot of things like that. Yeah. I know Mason stuff. knows him from that gig. Cause yeah. he kind of took over or was, was doing it for a second. That's a cool, that's a really, so you're having a good time with this, man. What are you going to do when you have to go back to work and tour? <laughs> uh, <laughs> reverb stockle to, drop. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's going to be hard to figure out which, which guitars to bring. Um, yeah, it's, it's fun, man. I, I love, I mean, guitars are just so cool. Yeah, I know they are. <laughs> so so is that, is, is that like your number? Do you actually take that out on the road? Sure. 
I mean, I, I just, I just finished, um, I just finished putting it together. Um, cause who's at my door? Somebody's at my door. Uh, I just finished putting it together. So, um, uh, I haven't taken it out yet. All right. So you're Daph 67 Daphne blue strat. What other two guitars would round out your top three? Yeah. The, the strat is actually, it's not 67. Um, it's, it's a weird, uh, it actually just, just got weirder, but it's, um, it was actually a Dano caster. The body was a Dano caster, which, um, was, was not in hindsight, was not a smart guitar to take apart. Uh, why is that? Because they, he's, he's just great. And then he stopped making guitars for a while and they got really expensive. Um, um so, so, and I, I didn't, I wasn't really thinking about it when I started messing with it. Um, and, and I hadn't quite gotten into the world of reverb yet. So, but anyways, <laughs> that it's, so the body is from that Danacaster and then the, the bridge pickup is a, from a Supro lap steel, uh, guitar. And, uh, and then the neck pickup is a Gaia tone. Um, and, uh, my buddy Mason actually just, just gifted me this, uh, this neck, uh, recently, and it's, it sort of completed the puzzle. So uh, what is that? Yeah, this is like the, the cooter. What is, what is the neck though? Oh, the neck is is made by a friend of Mason, and um, he just gives it this like deep V sort of profile. It's just like a a modified all parts neck. Okay. Um, it looks like ro is it roasted maple or? No, no, okay. it's not roasted. It's just dirty. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, what would be number two? So, number two would probably be. I have this uh, 1960 or 61 Harmony Meteor that I've, oh, yeah. that I've used on um, a lot of pockets uh, and it's got these gold foil pickups and most of most of those guitars play terribly. And this one um, I got from T.R. Crandall in New York, uh, which is one of my favorite guitar stores. Um, and uh, and it just he set it up and it just plays just plays great and sounds sounds good it's not i've tried to use it in live situations and it doesn't it doesn't really pack the same punch but for what we do with scary pockets real quiet in the studio it's just got a it's got a vibe it's you know hollow body yeah. hollow body funk um I mean, so that ask, i want to ask yeah. you a question about that i have a i don't know if you could see it over there it's hanging it's a yeah stratotone it's with the gold foils oh yeah yeah, yeah. and uh i was I didn't know this when I bought it because I played one in Nashville with a buddy of mine and it was like, Oh my God, I got to have one of these. It sounds great. But then I got this one. And it was like, eh, like you said, not so much. And there's yeah. no, um, truss rod. Yeah. And the next was fucking horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, right. They'll need a neck reset and you got to cook the neck to get it straight. Yep. Maybe refret. So yeah um any like advice i took it down to i have a pretty good luthier and st pete and he shaved the bottom half to exactly what you said to sort of like make yeah. the neck sort of straight uh any other yeah get yourself what? a good a good tech <laughs> yeah i know i'm gonna probably wind up selling it because it was just not yeah with a good yeah they're they tend to be pretty cheap i actually just did that i bought and sold one of those guitars just because um at this point there i have there's too many yeah it's too many well you want to sound good too if it's, it's yeah not, it's just this... what i've what i've learned is you can't play them all at once yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't play them but plus you if can you only buy play one, one at a time don't like when you bought your meteor you have probably had these expectations because you you know the sound in your head with the gold uh -huh. foil and then when it's you know it's like you know finding a woman who's beautiful and then i don't know she takes off her makeup and it's ugh. right I don't, you know, whatever. Right. That's what I felt like with this guitar. It's like, I'm, yeah. I'm always going to be disappointed when I pick it up. I want to be excited, right. you know, anyway. That's yeah. A weird. Yes. Analogy. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Sorry. Sometimes, sometimes you, you, um, sometimes the journey with guitars is, is fun. Um, because there've been so many guitars where I've had a, a an idea in my head of what I thought it was going to be. And then you put it all together and it's like, ah, it's not quite there. And then that sort of journey from good to great, you know what I mean? Where 
where it's so often like it could just be like even a tweak of the the type of strings or like the string yeah. gauge. Um, like I've learned with these, I use these Crucci and Ellie pickups in, in two or three of my guitars. Uh, what are they called? You have like called, more, uh, like what's they're esoteric. Crucci and Ellie's. Crucci yeah, they're, and they're, um, they are uh, pickups from the 50s that were uh, Italian. You can find them. The Crucci and Ellie was a brand of guitar. They also put them in Vox guitars. Um, and uh, and I kept trying to put flats on these guitars with Crucianelli's flats and a Bigsby, and it, they kept just sounding like um, they, the guitars had a cold or something. Like it, it just wasn't <laughs> resonating in the way that I was trying to uh, get to. And and sure enough, like it's, I just put light lighter rounds, and both guitars that I've been on this journey, they just kind of come to life. Um, oh, that's often, cool. like tweaking the bridge or we'll do it like the material of the bridge and the string gauge, just these little, like, like the pots, sometimes pot, people don't realize how important pots are. Um, but like changing out pots for like fifties, you know, CTS or whatever, good, good pots where when you turn down the volume, you don't lose all your tone, mm -hmm. um, that, that can make a big difference. So it's, I've, I've come to sort of enjoy, like sometimes like when you're saying, uh, with with the Stratotone, you get a guitar and you know it's just not going to do the trick. It's not going to be inspiring. But every once in a while, if you get a thing and you know that the greatness is in there, the journey to try to bring it out of the guitar it can be fun. So tell me, give, give me two things you would do if you were, you were me. For the Stratotone? Yeah. Um, well, I what could be cool, I mean, first I'd, I'd get it playing good. So I, I would probably... That's what I, he that's what did. the guy did. He planed it. Okay. So, so he, um, so he did a neck reset and a refret. He didn't do a refret, but it, what okay. would happen was it was buzzing at the top because uh -huh. the way the, it was kind of like bowed. Yep. Yep. And so he planed it. So he got rid of, a, a got good, rid of the buzz. A, yeah. And a good chunk of the bow, which I was really surprised because it was, yeah. Yeah. It's, traditionally with those, I, I'm not, I'm not like a, an expert in terms of doing the actual work. So, but in my experience, what guys have told me is, um, is they'll, they'll like cook the neck straight um, and then uh, do like a level and a re refret. Frets makes such a huge difference putting like, okay. so I might put big frets on it. And, uh, and then with, with, the, with that guitar, I, I think it, it might be cool to put a Bigsby and then real heavy flats like twelves. Oh uh, wow! And then um, and then tune it down to D or C sharp, something like that. And so I would think that that might yield interesting results. Okay, twelve flat wounds and tuned down and a refret. All right, so then it becomes the old, the age. But old. then, but then you're in it for more than it's I worth. Know, right, that's the problem. Like, so, yeah. So it's just a commitment of like, all right, well, whatever this yeah. is, I'm gonna live with it because yeah, get out of it. Or I could sell it. <laughs> or you could just sell it. Yeah, I'm gonna pro. I hate to do it, but I'm probably gonna go the path of least resistance, which is just yeah. to sell it. Yeah, because yeah, could, you know, if it was cheap enough, then I could just you know put it towards something else. Right. Exactly. Recycle our guitar dollars. That's what's important. Yeah, I mean, you could you could you could buy you could find one of those guitars for just about the price of like a 60s bigsby yeah right i, think I bought one for 300 bucks 350 bucks yeah this was just a tad more than that yeah all right so the harmony meteor which is another which i could buy a harmony they're a little more money but they're cool guitars um and what would be number three for you um man i i got this thin twin have you ever messed with thin twins no what is that um, once again, I need to give Mason Stoops credit, um, but he he has a thin twin. Uh, there, it's like this uh, uh, guitar from the '50s, like one of the I think it was one of the first like electric guitars. It's it's um, there's no sound holes, but it's like semi hollow, um, and it's a, the scale is very long. Uh, okay. And um, I don't. I just took it to a, a guy to get the pickups rewound because uh, they were sounding weak. 
but the guitar itself plays amazing. I took it with me on this vacation I was just on and I was glued to it because it's just like, it's such a unique, it, it feels so uh, like sturdy and like the scale is long and it's just like, it's a very- What is it unique. shaped like? Um, it's shaped like, uh, I mean, it's it's a bigger body and it's probably three, two to three inches deep. And um, and uh, yeah, they're like these old K. They were branded, you know, different names, craft, twin, old craftsman or K or um, twin, twin guitar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen these. It, it's almost looks like a country ish a yeah. jazz box mutated with a country. OK, so I played Mason's a long time ago and I've been looking for one. Uh, since because it was so cool but i feel like that that's a well that oh my god um, pricey as hell really well i mean i just pulled this this one is a jimmy reed so anything with someone's name on it let me look at something <laughs> well you know, yeah, you, you know can, how it goes you can find them i mean you can find a messed up one for you know i would think 700 bucks 800 bucks uh if you look if you look hard enough okay um, yeah and then and then one you know, like a good deal on one that already plays good might be around 1200. Yeah. they So they have, so did you have those uh, like tube uh, lipstick pickups or did you? Yeah. 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 I've never heard of one of these. They're really wild looking. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're cool. But I, yeah, choosing, a, choosing a third is, is tough. There's, it's just a, yeah, there's a lot of good ones. God, you have such a, a like a wide an eclectic taste in guitars, man. It's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, there it's it's a fun, you know, it's like a fun, fun path to go down in terms of there's just so much to learn about, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Um, and and it all makes a difference. Um, and at the same time, it doesn't matter at all because <laughs> it's just all all in your fingers. But if you if you have time to kill, you know what I mean? It's like learning about uh, what different types of pots do and strings sound like and, you know, wood materials and different pickups and, you know, how they're wired and what this pickup sounds like, why this pickup sounds different than this pickup and, you know, scale lengths and necks and all the models. And yeah, it's, it's a fun, um, it's a fun path. I like what you just said. It all makes a difference, but it doesn't matter at all. That was very yeah. profound. That's yeah, like something I, there, smoke some weed I had an experience where <laughs> we, we um scary pockets had Robin Ford uh on a record we did last year with Larry Goldings. Okay. Uh was that two years ago? I think it was two years ago now. And he was playing this like uh this Les Paul. Um it's like a 59 conversion or something. And uh and he he was playing through i think he was playing through my princeton like 64 okay. or 65 princeton reverb and he must uh, love that amp because i had him on the show here and he's just super particular about what he plays through yeah well it was funny because i my a friend of mine had a dumble mm -hmm. and he had like worked with robin before and um I was in his shop telling him about this thing I was about to do. And he was like, Oh, I'll bring him, I'll bring him some maps. I'll bring him my Dumble and he can use whatever he wants. And so he brought like uh, some tweed, some like fifties tweed and he brought a Dumble. And then I had like a couple of my amps there. I had a, uh, like a fifties deluxe and, and, uh, and a 65 Prince reverb. And he ended up, I mean, I guess, cause we were in the room and he didn't want to like have to crank the Dumble um you know dumbles loud so he i guess yeah. that's why i chose the the prince in is because of the volume but um anyways he 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 sounded great he sounded great and we were playing all day and he was right next to me and then the day ends and i don't know what i was expecting but i i picked up his guitar at the end of the day after listening to him play all this amazing shit on it yeah and um and the, just the experience of like hearing him on that guitar and then picking it up right after and me playing, I was like, I don't know what I was expecting, but it just sounded like me. And it was, it was, <laughs> you were disappointed. It, was like so, it was so disappointing. And, <laughs> but also so such a great lesson. Yeah. 
of of like yeah i mean gear is fine and it matters but it doesn't really matter you know yes. what i mean like yeah. it, it's a palette it's a palette with which to paint you know but you're still the one painting so right um it is it it never ceases to amaze me how um like how much your tone is just like the sound of your flesh hit you know on the strings that's um, such a good story well, you're like yeah, Rob, like, this guitar sucks robin like <laughs> sounds like yeah, shit <laughs> yeah something must have broken in the yeah. time that you played it from right. the time that i picked it up so that's a great story man yeah i love that that is hilarious wow um favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with you've had like a, a talk about a palette i mean um, yeah yeah we've had, almost we've been un- blessed yeah it's an um, unfair question uh man that's that's like that's probably my favorite part of this um project is getting to play with so many amazing musicians because all like almost all of them i feel like oh my god no this is my favorite drummer like you know what i mean <laughs> yes the next guy it's like okay no this is he's the best um i know exactly what you mean because i feel the same way yeah with, so with, i with i the do interviews. feel like they're they're all the like and, and it's fun like most the thing about drummers is um kind of to to that robin guitar story is most of the time they use my drums i have this like 65 gold sparkle kit and um yeah that's right they're not and, coming in with their own drum kit for a session right and like most because my kick drum says scary pockets on it so most of the time i'll just bring it to sessions and i'll tell drummers they can bring they can bring whatever they want to play and most of the time they're just like ah oh, this sounds good i'll play this and uh and we use most of the time just strip down kit kick snare hat um and uh and so he, on that bare bones of a situation getting to hear this palette of like the some of the most amazing drummers in the world and how different because it's kind of the same thing like it's just a stick it's a stick on some like skin and a and a wood ring and just hearing like the different tones and the different sounds that each of these drummers get from playing the same kit is kind of wild that's so Um, cool and but yeah they're they're um there's so i mean there's there's so many amazing people that i just love playing with lamar uh lamar carter is incredible um and uh tamir barzalay is is one of my favorite drummers he's great we just we just had uh joey warnker oh uh, cool who's did you have kenny what's that have you had kenny aronoff no no we yeah. haven't he's so fun. he's 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 as a, he's such a personality man it's quite fun oh cool yeah um but joey was incredible and and again haven't heard him on so many records um yeah it was just such a wild experience he'd sit down and he was playing real quiet which i loved <laughs> and uh and but like as soon as he as soon as he sat down and just started hitting things to see what they sounded like it sounded like the records that I've heard him on, like his yeah. touch is just so, so distinct. And he was able to pull so much tone, like out of the kit, uh, with, with, in such a like effortless and musical and sensitive way. Um, and just a delightful, delightful guy. So that, that was a blast to have him. Uh, you have, I don't, I'm not trying to get you to throw anybody in the bus. Tell me the weirdest thing that's happened. You don't have to name the name unless you want to. <laughs> the weirdest. Like thing. you had to look, you're dealing with musicians. You had to have like the one guy that like, I don't know, came in in his track suit and I don't know, down to bottle of vodka or something weird had to happen. That's a good question. Uh, let's see. Like you, like you and Jack were looking at each other like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, not, I don't, I, nothing really comes to mind. Really? Mo- almost all, um, almost everybody that we have on, I've worked with before. 
Okay. okay. So, you know okay. what I mean? So it's at vetting. Least from, at least from a musician perspective, singers. Okay. Singer, like a lot of the singers that I don't know, and but we'll work together over and over again. I get to know, know them. Um, but yeah, no, no, everybody's. No weirdness. I don't think there's been any any weirdness i mean um yeah uh, no mm. nobody like the 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 most difficult things are when people bail have or like the day of oh because like, you got everything set up and it's like that's as close as it gets to weirdness is like one yeah. time we had a drummer and he was setting up in the morning and he got a phone call and his dad had a stroke oh. um and he had to like run yeah to, the hospital and that was awful yeah obviously, for, for obvious reasons um but then but then you know so that's happened uh in a, not that specific situation but where a where a musician has um you know had to bail you know the night before or the day of or singer has to bail and you have to scramble to find someone else because we're on like a strict schedule oh yeah but, um, but yeah no no real like what's up with this guy type type stories i had a weird story want to tell you my weird story please it's, it's pretty it's i have a strong stomach this was gross okay. so i'm interviewing a guy and um he was looking kind of like how you are your laptop's down but it was he was distance maybe two or three feet away from it and so the laptop was a little lower mm -hmm. and he we're talking and he crosses his legs uh -huh. right and he's, and this is, I didn't do videos early on. I mean, we we're talking, but I just didn't record the videos. How yeah. I wish I did. Uh, mm -hmm. He starts um, picking his toenails. Like, wow. Well, I mean, no, like he, he started picking them. Like it was a celebration of toenails or something. Oh my God. Right. And again, I have a really strong stomach. Yeah. So that I was like a little weird, but you know, whatever yeah that's that's not that's not cool oh we're just getting started oh no uh, he i guess apparently gets a really appetizing toenail uh oh and no i slowly see him lift the toenail up and i'm like i know it's fucking gonna happen i know it's no gonna happen. and he looks up and he holds this is while we're talking like like right and and he holds the toenail up and i can see him like like salivating like wow that's no a good one. takes the toenail puts it in his it must have been from his big toe because it was fucking massive toenail wow he puts it in his mouth and as he puts it in his mouth i'm i'm watching his body language and it's like uh you know like um your favorite dessert that you haven't oh, had God. Like your favorite cheesecake you're like oh you know you let what's it what's his name i want to hire this guy. <laughs> only if he does the toenail thing man oh my and, god and and he puts it in his mouth and he's like mm. and I, like he's like uh endorphins started releasing because he was it was like you sure there wasn't like a bowl of cashews and, no it, and, it, um, it, no it was a bowl of toenail definitely man. a toenail oh yeah and oh, i was my god and, and i I was so taken aback. Like I wanted to say something to him. Like that is fucking gross. Don't I, <laughs> like I what I thought of one time when I was very young. This is in, in the seventies in New York City. I went down to the college fair at the New York Coliseum, which doesn't exist anymore, on Fifty Ninth Street. And I remember uh, again, New York in the seventies. There was a homeless guy, and he just pulled down his pants and took a shit. Uh. But that was commonplace back then. Right. For, right. I when thought of that. Go, you gotta go. <laughs> I got to go. And that's what I thought of because I hadn't seen anything that like out of sorts since then. It was like, you know, anyway, yeah. so that's, that's my. Weird oh, story. my God. Well, yeah, luckily we've avoided that so far. <laughs> I'll, keep, I'll keep an eye out. When, when, you know, Sam Wilkes does like to wear sandals. Uh, so I'll keep an eye out for oh that. My God. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, this is not about my weird story. It's about your weird story. But it, that oh. was such a, that was. Yeah, we my, needed that. We yeah, needed I mean, that. who can beat that? I mean, that was just like, I was almost impressed by like, wow, that was ballsy. Uh, yeah. 
Now, how do I ask you the next question, which is, have you ever sold a guitar you wish you can get back? It's like, we need a, we need a segue question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of regret, speaking of regret, uh, <laughs> regrettable situations, uh, have I ever sold a guitar I wish I could get back? Um, well, when I was, not really, but when, when I was a, when I was younger, um, my, the first arch top I ever had was a, a heritage, like a oh, big yeah. body, um, heritage. And, um, I just, I just didn't know what I was doing. And I, I got a bit swindled, uh, uh -uh. <laughs> cause I think I sold it on Craigslist and I was probably like 20, 21 or 22. Um, and I just, yeah, I, I was, I was young and naive and, uh, and I met a guy in, in a Jack and Jack in the box and he, he talked me down. Um, he, <laughs> I met he was a guy like, in no, Jack this in guitar the is not worth, you know, he's like, that's ah, guitar is not worth this is because this and this, and uh, I'll give you, I'll give you this for it. And I don't remember how much I sold it for, but um, I was like, uh, okay. I just kind of like, I just kind of got a little taken. And then I remember um, I like, googled his name uh like a the next day or something or a couple of days later and i saw that he was selling it for like twice you know uh, two or three times what he what he had told me it was worth it wasn't so, uh norm's guitar was what's that it wasn't norm from norm's guitars was it? no it's not norm <laughs> um but yeah other other than that i don't i don't think i've i mean ask me in a year or two uh yeah. <laughs> it'll happen at some point but but yeah, I've I've sort of like removed the a lot of the sentimentality from um, from guitars like in the last year or two where there there were definitely guitars that I've just had forever that right. I thought I might regret and I haven't yet because I feel like if it's not inspiring you um, and it's then it's taking up space um, from something that could inspire yeah. you and it it might inspire someone else so I so i think um yeah and and they do come back like if you really want a guitar back you really regret it then you know it's it's there might be a way to to get it back at some point you you know that that kind of happens um so yeah i i've i've sort of like made a mental shift and just just you know gotten rid of stuff that i don't play you probably don't I attach read it so far. You probably don't like just in general aren't attached to to things in general. Um yeah, I I, I don't know. I I guess not. Yeah. I guess I, not. Yeah, because I don't like I don't attach to things per se. I mean, even if there's nostalgia with it, it's just a thing. Right, right. For me, I, anyway. I will say the guitars I've been making the last like year or so I feel way more attached to, um, because there's, they're unique to, there's only one of them. Do you know what I mean? They're unique to me. So that those, like if I'm, I might re regret, you know what I mean? Getting yeah. Well, you got sweat equity in there too. It's different right. than you just buy right. something and on reverb or whatever, or yeah. store. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, what's the last thing you listened to musically recently? Um, the last thing I listened to was, uh, I did, I had a rehearsal yesterday and the guy was playing cool. told me about this guy, Adam Melcher. Do you Who's know that? Yeah. No, I don't know. He, he's, he was raving about this record and, um, and so I was checking it out and it was cool. Um, I'll check him out. Yeah. Uh, another list question, top three desert Island discs, just for this minute. Oof. Mm -hmm. Um, top three desert Island cds albums mm -hmm. dating myself you are uh elliot smith xo um i guess i'll go i guess i'll go uh sergeant pepper okay and um pet sounds oh cool that's a that's a pretty record man pet sounds I oh yeah i tell you that but yeah All right. Tell me, uh, 
tell me about one or two things you've done or one or two changes you've made, Ryan, that have had the biggest impact on your life. And it could be in any area, personally, professionally, spiritually, musically, anything that was important to you and sort of changed, changed your life. Interesting. Um, let's see. Um, well, exercising, uh, oh. exercising changed my life. Um, yeah, I feel like I, I kind of discovered it in like my, like mid to one early twenties. Um, great. and, uh, and I've found like trying to figure out how to live as like a professional musician when your schedule is so uh you know constantly changing um it gave me some like structure to to my day and uh because you had to fit it in yeah yeah and, yeah it's like i sort of realized like okay i do well working in the morning and then uh and then like i have this lull in the afternoon like around three or four so i would i just go exercise then and it would, you know, it would split up the day and give me some structure and like, just gave me a, a little more energy and, and made me uh, feel better. Um, so that that's, I feel like that's, that's been real important to my sanity. Um, and then uh, what else? <laughs> this is, it's going to sound like a, like a health. Uh, no, no, whatever it is. Health yeah. podcast. But uh, the, like three or four years ago now, probably four years ago, uh, my friend Jack Stratton sent me a podcast about nutrition. And, uh, and that was a game changer just because I had, uh, never thought about food before. Um, and, uh, and just, uh, learning about, you know, nutrition and, uh, just kind of blew my mind as far as like, Oh my God, I've been eating three times a day for, you know, 30 years. And I know nothing about food and like what I, what's good for you and what makes you. And so that sort of just sent me down a path of, uh, of like just experimenting with like different ways of eating. And, um, and I went like plant-based, uh, you know, whole food plant-based, for like two or three months and it really changed the way that I felt all of a sudden like it was like a reset and I had all this energy and felt good when I ate and uh and anyways I I've sort of you know backed off into something less strict and more sustainable that just mm -hmm. like works for my life and makes me feel good but that was a that was like a step up in terms of like you know feeling good or, you know, things that affect my general well-being. Um, yeah. Three, three things you said, I need one I more. Said, thing. I said one or two, but you can tell me a third. Oh, one. One. I gave you two. Yeah, Great. You did. You did. You're, you're like, diet and exercise. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. What, uh, what got you into exercising? I, I'm, I'm shocked because you seem like you have a good energy level. So I just assume you're one of these guys that always exercises or is always fit. Um, so whatever you're doing is working because that, you know, just, well, you, you know, you meet people that with high energy and low energy, and I can tell you right now, most of the ones with low energy don't exercise. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. That's my yeah. observation. It, um, let's see. Well, my dad always was into exercising and I had just, I'd never really done it. I think maybe touring got me into it because come like, you know, 23, um, I, I was like touring a decent amount and it was a thing that you could do on the road that would kind of keep you sane. And then when yeah. I got home, um, I just sort of, uh, I just sort of continued it. And I had a friend that was like a trainer. And mm. so he, he would, um, he kind of like showed me, you know, what to do and didn't, didn't charge me his, his full rate. Um, so yeah, it just became kind of like a, you know, foundation, Hobby. What do you, what do you do? Um, well, it, back then it was, it was like circuit style, just like, you know, weights and, and jumping around and, you know, um, 
that kind of thing. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I guess I, I was doing like yoga for a while, which mm. is like, you know, kind of cool. And then, uh, and then now I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of that just like different, you know, weights and like body weight stuff and push ups and pull ups and, cool. uh, yeah. And then biking, um, which is great out there. Cause it's actually like here in Florida, everything's straight, but out there you right. actually work when you're mm-hmm. getting on a bike. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And, and so what do you, how do you eat now? Like you, you don't eat vegetarian. You just like eat better, make better food choices basically. So yeah. Um, now I eat like, I would say, man, diet, talking about diet we really start like people are religious about their diet it's so personal people's like do you not want to share so it easy. it's okay it's so easy no no no. I'll, I'll talk about it but it's like don't, you don't. Know, from it you <laughs> you um you I, you see how people get evangelical about it because everyone has like an opinion on it and it's you know it's people don't want you to take their thing away and just, well that's bullshit talk. whatever works for you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so, so what like, when and like when ended up what ended up working for me is like in my house, I'm, I'm pretty vegan, like whole food plant-based Yeah. where I just, that's how I cook for myself. And then it's impossible to do, to do that when you're eating out because sure. everything has a, a ton of, you know, restaurants cook with a lot of salt and oil. And yeah. anyway, so, so I basically, when I go out, I don't, I don't worry about it too much. And yeah. so I basically just like a, a, a really bad vegan, you know, <laughs> a really bad vegan. <laughs> yeah. Where I'm, I'm not, and I'm not super strict, but I try to eat that way. Most of the time, dude, that would be a good YouTube channel. Really bad. A vegan. Really bad vegan. Yeah, yeah. I can see that now you can make that work. I'm telling yeah. you and you can do the music for it. Exactly. So it's a plus. Uh, that's so funny. Yeah. I always, I thought you, you just seemed very healthy. I figured you were a long time exerciser. Um, that will actually pay off for you like health wise. Like you do it. And maybe you're doing it for health. Now I know when I started exercise when I was younger, it was like, Oh, I want to be in shape. It was vanity based. And now it's like, right, right. I just want to survive to tomorrow. <laughs> 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 and because I've exercised, I get to survive to tomorrow so far, you know, nice. Nice. Um, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Oh man. Um, I like most about myself um I'm I'm very uh uh empathetic Mm -hmm. I think I think I I just um I care I care I love my friends and I care deeply about people um and uh and I, I think that's yeah, that feels kind of like core to uh, to me, and 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 uh, I think I think that that's good. That is good. Are you you're at like you seem super easygoing. I know, like la- when we earlier you said something about uh, you worry sometimes, but you like you seem like one of these guys. It would be impossible to not get along with you. Like, <laughs> no, there's a few people that, <laughs> well, I mean, there's always a few people, but I mean, you, you just seem like very amiable. Like, you know, you're like, I think, yeah, generally, I think I'm yeah. pretty agreeable. I think yeah. I'm pretty agreeable. Um, not like and, a pushover, and, but just like e- easy to work with, you know? And not, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, I think so. I yeah. tend to assume things are my fault <laughs> and things go wrong. So uh, but yeah, I, I think that's good for other like, people who are insecure, because if you assume that they'll be like, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not my um, fault for sure. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think, you know, touring, um, like just coming from that world of mm. being in a bunch of bands. Um, I think that's, that's a helpful, you know, I tend to just be sort of kind of quiet and and i like just kind of read read the room you know what i mean i'm yeah i'm not super you know come into a situation and insert myself i just sort of like especially when i'm in in a new group of people i'll just sort of like be in my head and and figure out like 
who, you know, what yeah. is the situation? Who's here? the alpha? What's the dynamics? How yeah. does this work? And yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. So um, you come across also, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I just want to no, say please. another please positive cut thing. <laughs> <laughs> please cut me off. You're such a good interview. Uh, no, I just want to say another positive thing. You, you're, you come across very service oriented. Like mm. what you just said here, you know, you care deeply about people, but I also think you care deeply about what you're involved with. And that comes across. Oh, thank you. Yeah. As a, as a, per, you know, you're a side person, you know, and like you've served as MD, I could see that being an easy decision for an artist to make because you just come across as the guy he's taking this shit seriously. Mm. I, you know, he's carrying the ball across the goal line for us. I, don't, I got nothing to worry about. Yeah um thank you yeah i'm welcome i'm i'm pretty conscientious and yeah i i think i do tend to thrive in that in that like people tend to do more for others than they will do for themselves mm -hmm. and now that i've done you know i've done my my solo thing enough like run bands for other people like pockets is this weird um you know amalgamation where it's you know i'm a lot of times, like, I kind of feel like I'm Jax, my partner, Jax, MD, you know what I mean? Yeah. I will have, when I'm putting bands together, I'll, I'll be thinking of like, who's Jack going to like? Um, so I, it's kind of a fun, there, there's both elements where it's, it feels like it's partially my project, but I'm also in service to like, not only Jack, but everybody that plays, comes to yeah. play with us. It's their project too. Um, and so it is like the, the solo thing for me always never felt like, um, it, it never felt a hundred percent natural to my, like who I am. Do you know what I mean? Right. It always yeah. felt slightly outside of my comfort zone. And I would try to just muscle myself into like that mindset. But for, for me, sort of arriving upon this uh, project does feel a bit more in my comfort zone as far as like it not being about me. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I, I do feel like I kind of thrive when I get to like, um, you know, help make somebody else's vision come, come to life. That being said, pat yourself on the back because you've released three solo records and I know what you're saying because I know how, you know, I know you a little bit now. You're not, this isn't like, hey, it's my solo record. It's just an expression of what you're thinking musically, right? Yeah. But um, the fact that it's kind of maybe not as much out of your comfort zone, pat yourself on the back for that because it's pretty cool yeah. to, to produce. Yeah, there you go, man. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. That's good, man. Thanks. All right. Something about yourself people might be surprised to hear or find a little odd. Well, I do this thing with my toenails. Do <laughs> you know I've told that story like three <laughs> times, and the the person I've told it to has carried it forward, not just to the end of the interview, but like they'll send me a, a, like a text with a bag, and I say, "Hey, man, I found this bag of toenails." Oh god! <laughs> oh god! It's really uh, an indelible story, man. Yeah, <laughs> makes its mark. Um, a, a thing people would be surprised or find a little odd. Or find a little odd. Yeah. Or so, if there's something, there may be nothing. I'm completely normal. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing odd about me. Uh, I don't know. I, I love basketball. That's cool. Maybe that's surprising. Um, Who do you root for? I like the Warriors. Yeah, of course. You're in, of course. Yeah. I, 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 I'm... I'm, I would say I'm slightly um, like my friends give me a lot of shit because well, I grew up both in LA and the Bay Area when mm -hmm. I moved up there from eight to 18. Um, so in high school, we'd go to Warriors games, you know, but they were not good. Right. Um, and I wasn't that into basketball then. And then I moved back down to LA and loved Kobe and uh -huh. would and would was like loved the Lakers. And then, uh, and then after Kobe retired, I sort of reconnected with my, my Bay area roots and the warriors to me are just the most fun team to, to watch. And I feel like I just connect with the, 
their their core values. Their core values. That's funny. Are you, are you a big guy? Do you play ball, basketball? Nope. <laughs> no and no. Happiest moment or happiest time in your life? Oh, I got a good. I got a good uh, weird one. Hey, I got a good Yeah. I when I was a kid, I was a StarCraft champion. What is that? Do you know the video game StarCraft? No, sorry. Okay. There's a computer game called StarCraft, which is, which I used to play for hours and hours in in like middle school and high school, and it was probably the thing that I am best. If Twitch existed back then, I might have just been a career StarCraft. Uh, it's champion. so funny. Like guitar might never have come into might. That. Yeah. Wow. Guitar might never have become a thing. All right. Now I'm going to look up the StarCraft game. Yeah, I wouldn't even bother. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste your time. You might get sucked in. No, no, I have no bandwidth for it. I'm not that guy. I'm, the only thing I used to play uh, with my kids when they were little, I played um, uh, Mortal Kombat. Nice. With my sons, we used to have round robins, and then we'd play... Uh, my wife bought me Tomb Raider one day and I became a, I, I wanted to solve the puzzle. It was very difficult. Right. There you go. Was, yeah. There you go. That's my extent of video games. Happens to the best of us. <laughs> uh, this is a good one. Happiest, happiest moment or happiest time in your life. Um, that's, that is a good one. So there, there was this time. Um, and I forget if I, I think we might have talked about this before. Um, but there was a time when I was playing with Michael Buble when I was touring mm -hmm. with him and I was about to start, um, playing with John legend. Yep. And did we talk about this before? And I, I had, um, don't know. I had these, uh, so basically, um, John was doing a run, like a four month run of performing arts centers with me and a string quartet. Um, and with the, so we, so there was like 25 arrangements that needed to be written string arrangements and the rehearsal was set. There was like a clear deadline. And so while I was on tour in Europe, like every waking moment was spent just like adapting his catalog for a string quartet. Wow. And so I'd like wake up every morning, I'd be in Paris, I would go to like a coffee shop and I would be on my laptop uh, just arranging strings. And, um, and I was working with like this amazing copyist going back and forth. So I had this whole flow where uh, he, he sent me like piano vocal, uh, like iPhone recordings. I would arrange strings uh, in, via MIDI and Pro Tools to the iPhone recordings, send them to him at his notes or feedback, he would give me the okay. And then I would send them to the copyist. And wow. so it was just, there, there was just, um, you know, when you feel like it, it feels dangerous because like there's so much work that needs yeah. to be done. I don't know if I'm gonna have time to do it. It was that sort of feeling of um, just be, and it was such satisfying creative work to do um, where there's like a clear goal and like just, figuring out the process and then each string arrangement is just like Sudoku. Um, and, uh, and then just doing that all day, you know, coffee shops, wherever, and then going to sound check and then going back to the bus and working and then going to do a show and then going, you know, and working again, just that like month of being in Europe with like people that I loved playing shows, arranging all day and having this, big thing to look forward to that I was really excited about. Like when I think back on that, that was one of the most uh, like fulfilling or satisfying times in my life. Dude, you don't have to answer, but I hope John gave you a bonus because that is serious commit. Seriously. That's a major commitment of that's exactly what I was talking about, man. You are, you come across, you like, you're super diligent. You're like, I want to do the, I want to make this. You have pride of ownership, of course, because you want to do it for yourself as well. But that service mentality. So I, I like call, a challenge. I can call I like John and get you some more money right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd love that. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> uh, Mr. Legend. You know that thing I did five years ago? I don't feel like <laughs> I was paid enough. <laughs> he, he, uh, he, he took care of me. I represent Ryan Lerman in the uh, uh, string case. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great, man. That's, that's what I'm talking about. That's how you come across, man. Oh, uh, do you have any non-musical superpowers? Non-musical, aside from StarCraft. Uh, <laughs> Uh, non-musical superpowers um not not the, oh mm, no not no. not that i'm not that i'm aware of maybe How about some, hobbies outside of music hobbies outside of music man bat just you know watching basketball is probably as close as i come tennis i, I got into the last um year and that's been really fun playing it or watching it playing that's cool tennis seems like a cool sport actually it's fun yeah especially when you can't be close to anyone it's <laughs> it, uh, oh that's it right it's a quarantine a, activity a, automatic social distancing exactly oh that's right i didn't think about that um yeah that's that's long tennis to get into favorite place you've traveled um tokyo ah what'd you like about it um, I love Japan and I love uh, Australia. Um, those are probably my two favorite places. Tokyo, man, the the culture, Japan is just endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, the culture is so deep and like unique, and going there just feels like you know for the first the first time just feels like you've landed on a different planet, um, and. Uh, yeah, it's it's the the nature there is like unique and awesome, and this the city everything's just like, uh, uh, like a multiple of ten. You like Tokyo is like ten New Yorks all up against each other, wow. and it's like weird. There's it's weird and amazing, and like everything is so well thought out. Like they're very like high conscientiousness culture. So like if you go to you go to a restaurant. And you sit at the bar and the stool, the top of the stools come off and you put your jacket or your purse or whatever inside the stool. And then you put the seat back on the stool and sit on it. It's like, that makes so much sense. So much sense. Why don't we do that? There's so, there's so many like little things yeah. like that where it's just like, they're, they're just such a thoughtful, um, you know, the, the culture is just uh, rich and the food is amazing and the coffee is amazing and the clothes fit me better than, <laughs> than here uh and just like yeah uh the 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 culture and and it's all endlessly fascinating to me there's a lot to dig into and learn about so in australia you know the people the food the coffee the beaches so you mentioned coffee a couple of times. What's a good coffee? Because I'm a coffee snob, sort of. Yeah, me too. When you, what do you when, drink? Well, right now I'm. Uh, these are stereoscope beans, which is a, a roaster uh, here in LA. Stereoscope. Okay. Um, I I tend to drink. Um, I like a cappuccino with oat milk, and I also mm -hmm. pour overs. Uh, I love. And Jap yeah, Japan just takes their coffee very seriously. There's a place called Glitch for anybody going to Tokyo that I would uh, that I would recommend. Uh, what I always I've never been there, but what freaks me out is if you see a photo or video of the subway station, their mm. subway station is cleaner than my kitchen. Yeah, I'm yeah, like, Every, everything's clean and and um. If you, someone told me the story once where, uh, like if you're, if you're walking down the street in Tokyo and you drop your wallet, you can come back to where you, where you were, uh, like a couple of days later and someone will have just moved your wallet to like the side of the sidewalk. So nobody steps on it. It's just like an insanely, and nobody will take it, will take it. Like everybody just has a very, um, a very high sense of like moral integrity it, it seems it seems like to to yeah to me um from from what i've been told it's just like unique that's unique amazing man. what an awesome yeah. place yeah i've seen some documentaries even in like the poor sections 
just people seem to work together towards a common goal a little like naturally. It's not like, Hey, let's really work hard to do this. It's not work hard. It's just, that's their nature. Let's, mm -hmm. you know, let's be a better, you know, it's like, like you said, doing the right thing is not like, right. you know, you have to be proud of that. It's just what you do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a few more questions and thanks for everything, man. It's been a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, of course. Of course. Um, yeah. Oh, cool. Toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? Oh, man. Um, toughest decision I've had to make. Well, um, being caught between those two gigs that I, that I mentioned earlier, um, between Bublé and John Legend, trying to figure out which, which path to go down was uh was the cause of much anguish at the time um yeah that that was that was tough i'm sure there's something of greater you know significance that i'm forgetting but that's that's what comes comes to mind at the moment what uh i usually don't ask this question but you're a pretty I could, this question to someone your age, but you're a pretty deep guy. So I want to ask some mutated version of it. Sure. How sure. have you changed the most, let's say over the last five to seven years? And yeah. Um, has that been an intentional change or just kind of like a natural? Mm. Aging? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, let's see. Uh, two things come to mind. The, the first is just um, leaning into uh, generosity, like com like coming from a place of just uh, giving a bit more, um, just dealings with, with everyone. Uh, and then the, the, the second way... Um, I, I don't try to change people as much. I think, I think ah. I, I take relationships um, at face value a little more. I think um, like I alluded to before, like in, in times of conflict, I, I tend to, um, I think I tend to gravitate towards like more disagreeable people for, for whatever reason. And then when things, when there, when there is conflict, I'll, I'll sort of assume like, well, I must be doing something to cause this situation. And, right. um, a lot of times I'm not, and that's it's somehow very difficult for me to grasp, but that like, well, this conflict is just a result of me and this person, the way that we're interacting. And it's not necessarily his fault or her fault, but it might not be my fault either. It's, and so just this coming to this realization of like, most of the time relationships are like groundhog's day where the experiences you tend to have with a person and the feelings you get from being with the person are pretty much what will happen over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, with, with, you know, exceptions of course, but, but generally it tends to be the case. So, when uh, yeah I, th I think that's that's a, a ma major place in, in which um i think i've grown or am trying to grow um where when conflicts arise or when a relationship isn't a fuck yeah relationship yeah i i think i'm qu quicker hopefully to move on from it and to not dwell on like well what am i doing to to make this how can i fix this difficult. yeah how, how can i fix this yeah i think both like in personal you know relationships and in in like work relationships i think that's a realization that's come in the last you know couple of years man uh i have some questions about that but i'm really happy that's like a lot healthier for you so good for you man Thanks. Yeah, just say, fuck you. That's something you got. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, so the first thing you said, leaning into giving more, what was, uh, what prompted that? Because you, you, you're super giving guy. I couldn't see like you not, unless I'm, I'm mis 
I'm, I'm <laughs> not, I mean, like, Jesus, you're so nice. Like, what the hell? I oh, mean, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think trying to navigate, I guess I'm, 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 I'm think of it more in the context of like, uh, um, like work stuff just i guess you know in the vein of what we've been talking about with gigs and side manning and i feel like a big part of doing this for a living is negotiating you know what i mean uh, yeah. and um Which uh, it is. yeah just like having to be your own manager uh yeah. over and over again when it's never a fair fight because you're you're dealing with somebody who does this for a living and they're representing someone else and you don't do it for a living and you're representing yourself. So it's, it's kind of like trying to figure out the balance of when to push and how hard to push and when to ask for a lot and when to say, don't pay me, I'll just do it. Uh, right. And, um, and so I think, yeah, if w one thing I've sort of uh, learned is like, I think it's 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 kind of this balance of having to say yes enough to where like you're making ends meet and you're you're like you have enough money to do what you want to do but also you know the friends that I have that really just lead with only doing stuff that they love musically and like yeah. connect with um I feel like that that tends to yield the best result because you're truly just leading with like yeah. your heart um and it's kind of finding that balance between like okay well i gotta eat but also i gotta eat but i want to be i happy. only want to do you know i'm i'm in this because my heart is in it and so i want to lead with that as well so very cool i don't know maybe there's an answer in there no somewhere. that's good no, that's, you know what I always say when I'm negotiating, I always say, I want to be fair and fair means being fair to you and fair to me. Yeah. And it's important to remember to be fair to yourself. And if somebody else disregards that, I don't, that's not somebody I want to deal with. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, it, a good result is when both people. You yeah. Know, but both people are equally happy, situation. not equally miserable, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> and like, and I agree with what you said, you know, doing stuff that makes you feel good. That's, so much better, man. Cause mm -hmm. I didn't do that for many, many years and it yeah. never, the result was never as good. Right. Yeah. So I agree. And the other thing you said, as far as trying to change people less, so like basically, uh, being less codependent, that's such a healthy thing. Man. I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm happy for <laughs> yeah, you because so. that's something that likes, you know, it's a, it's, you know, people that tend to be very nice struggle with that because you're like, you know, I get it. So I'm really happy that, that, that's, yeah. A, yeah. I'm happy for you that that's a change. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good for you, man. Uh, uh, and the last question, is, uh, just any final words of wisdom. I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for the, for the wisdom. Me too. Uh, that's why I, <laughs> I need something. Yeah. Um, final words of wisdom. Um, Yeah, I'm at a loss. Yeah, me too. Don't worry about it. Um, man, I want to thank you very much. I uh, This is my prediction. I think you're going to get a Grammy at some point oh in time. Oh, my God. No, he's, I'm, no bullshit. I don't, this is the second time I've said this, okay? okay? I think you're going to get a Grammy. When you get it, I would love you to come back on here. I, I'd love you to come back on in like a few years anyway because you're a Great. super talented guy. You're super easy to work with. I think you're going to like, even in this music business, great things are going to continue happening to you. You got a great attitude and you're a nice person and you're super talented musically. So just uh, let me know that you'll come on here in a few years and I'll do it. Back. And I get a Grammy. I'll give it to you. How's that? No, no, no. Just come back on. I don't want to have to just promise you. I don't, I'm not going to have to go through your guy to get to you. Like great. You know, that I can great. just text you because I have no patience. You can text me. You great. can text me. Okay. Cause you will get a Grammy and I'd love to have you back on here, man. I'm just excited to follow your career going because you're very uh, talented. You got a lot. Thank of stuff you so much, on. Craig. You're so no, good sorry. at this, man. It's been, been such a pleasure to talk to you.
Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Feelings are mutual. I want to tell people where to find you. Uh, it's Ryan Lerman, L-E-R-M-A-N. First of all, his last record, Noisy Feelings. He's got three solo records. I listen to Noisy Feelings. It's a lovely record, man. It's really good. Nice. Very moving. You. Uh, you don't need me to sell Scary Pockets, but if you're not hip to Scary Pockets, check them out. They're a lot of fun. Um, they It's just a, a great, fun project. And you can we talked about this earlier. You can see how much fun you're having uh, when you're up there playing. Like, you know, you're smiling and you're grooving and it's nice to see as an as a fan it's nice to see that you know um yeah and, yeah, and so uh, find him on youtube uh instagram are you on instagram yep okay what is it just ryan lerman it's at ryan lerman yep okay great all right um also and, and youtube what else is there any, what else can i pitch man grammy uh, vote for him in the grammys vote for me please uh the yeah. academy academy uh, yeah uh no i think i think you covered it i think when that's you, any it. new tours coming up there's any announcements for you um no uh pockets will tour next year uh hopefully everywhere um and uh but nothing nothing, concrete. nothing yet. do you guys come down here to florida um we haven't yet but i would love to it's really it's a weird it, it's, it's it's hard to make to money to. in florida man it's really yeah, hard because it's just getting there and getting out of there. It's, it's, hard. it's a pain in the ass. A lot of people don't come here for that reason. Right. It's, it's a hard thing, man. Um, well, I hope you do come here. Cause if you do, yeah, me too. I, I would love to connect with you. Um, that's it, man. Uh, hang on with anything else that you, anything else you want to leave people with? No, this is a blast. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks for coming on. It was real nice to meet you. Uh, and, uh, I want to thank Tim for that. Tim hooked us up. Tim LaFave. Yeah. Yeah. God uh, bless him. Yeah. He's awesome, man. Love All right. Him. Everybody check out Ryan Lerman, please. RyanLerman.com. He's got a great website uh, and he's a great dude. So, and vote for him. Academy. Come on. Uh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Hang on one second. Let me wrap this up. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Ryan Lerman. He's a wonderful guy, super talented musician. If you're not hip to him again, check out RyanLerman.com. Latest record is Noisy Feelings. On Instagram at Ryan Lerman, uh, scary pockets and uh, buy t shirts, I guess. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Mm, Be nice. There's the, word, there's the word of wisdom. There you go, man. I say that every day to remind myself. I love uh, it. Every day I hit the ground and I try to think about that. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> happiness is a choice to so choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time. Peace and love, everybody. I am out. Ryan, thank you for everything, brother. Thank you, Craig.